You can register for part two of this series by clicking on the link in the description. And uh, after you provide your name and email, you should be able to get access. It's absolutely free to watch uh, part two of this series on demand on the ON24 platform. Uh, what we cover in part two of this series is, you know, controlling container resource consumption with control groups. We also talk about implementing access control for containers with app armor. And then we talk about limiting container system calls and performing vulnerability scanning for Docker containers. And we finally end uh, by taking you through the process of building secure Docker images. So if you want to register for part two of this series, all you need to do is click on the link in the description and you should have access immediately. Hey guys, Hackersploit here, back again with another video. Welcome back to the Docker Security Essential series. In this video, we're gonna be taking a look at how to secure the Docker daemon. Now, before we move further with this video, I just want to make it clear that this particular uh, case, or when it comes down to securing the Docker daemon, uh, this is going to be really, really user-centric and deployment use case centric in that some of these steps and procedures may not apply to you, uh, you know, depending on the type of environment you're working in. And I just wanted to, you know, make that as clear as possible. So you don't need to follow exactly what we do. Uh, I'm simply, you know, going through these steps so that uh, if it is applicable to you you can go ahead and enable or set up a particular security uh, protocol or um, you know uh, implement a security practice um, so with that out of the way we can finally begin uh, let us get started by taking a look at what we'll be exploring in this video so firstly we'll talk about managing access to the docker daemon that is going to be handled uh, practically we'll also take a look at implementing tls encryption for uh, actually authenticating and connecting to the docker daemon We'll then take a look at implementing user namespaces. This is very, very, very important. And finally, disabling inter-container communication, which again will depend on whether or not you require that type of functionality, but it is a recommended security protocol or practice to put into play. Uh, so when it comes down to implementing TLS uh, you know, encryption, uh, in regards to encrypting traffic between the various Docker components, this is only going to apply if you have a remote docker host and you want to connect to the docker host or the docker daemon remotely through a client so for example if we take a look at the infrastructure so we have the client here and we have the remote docker host and i'm just going to annotate this uh sorry let me just annotate that to to mean remote right so that is our remote docker daemon and this is typically the case in production and development environments where you have a Docker a host running the Docker daemon and then uh, developers, uh, you know, uh, DevOps uh, engineers can all connect through various other clients. So, you know, we can say uh, client two, right? And they all again connect to the Docker host. Now, as I mentioned in the first video in this series, that this connection is facilitated through a domain socket and uh, you use a domain socket when it is a local connection so when you're working on the same server and you're authentic and you're actually sending commands from the client to the docker host uh you know locally then this is handled through a domain socket now if it's done remotely as uh, what we're inferring here then it's done through a tcp socket now uh, you, you you might be asking well what of the connection well are, are the commands or is the connection itself secured well by default it isn't and that's what we're trying to address so the way we go about securing this particular connection this particular remote connection is to implement tls encryption right so you're encrypting your traffic so you may be asking well why exactly do we need to do that well the reason we need to do that is because if we get a malicious actor here uh, and uh, you know they intercept the traffic that's being sent between the client and the docker host and it is unencrypted they can perform a man in the middle attack right and they can read the commands uh, you know that are being sent from the client to the uh, docker daemon and vice versa so that's very 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 important that we enable tls encryption if you are you know authenticating to your docker daemon remotely uh, and again as i said that's quite common so uh, we need to make sure that TLS encryption is set up and uh, I'll be taking you through that process. Uh, we then need to move on to an essential aspect, which is, um, you know, implementing the actual namespaces. 
So when it comes down to namespaces, as I mentioned again in the first video, namespaces are a feature of the Linux kernel that are used for the isolation or partitioning of an operating system resource. So namespaces make it possible to run containers. Well, you may be asking how, I, I don't understand, how, uh, how exactly does it do this? Or, uh, you know, how does this work? Well, uh, if you think of a container as an isolated space, and remember we talked about the emulation layer, and how emulation takes place where each container uh, utilizes the Linux kernel uh, of the host operating system. Well, it uses namespaces to, to partition and isolate aspects of an operating system that you not normally think about as important. So for example, in this particular, in the context of containers, namespaces are used to isolate resources like users, networks, and PIDs, so that each container has its own process uh, has its own process tree has its own network has its own file system and it's not using or sharing the same one that the host operating system is using and again it does this for every container so uh, that's why you know namespaces make it possible for us to have containers so again in our particular case we'll be talking about user namespaces here so when we run a docker container the process by default is going to be run from the default namespace and as a result will be run with the root account so what do i mean when i say this and of course this will make sense when we get into the practical demonstration so uh, what i mean here is that when you start up a container uh, within the container based on the user permissions you've specified it's going to run as the it's going to run as the root user right we're not talking about container security we're trying to prevent container uh, we're, we're trying to essentially prevent container breakouts so uh, if you run a container and you and you leave it running so you know you you detach from the container and you go into your host operating system and you view the process tree you'll see that the actual docker container is running under a process but the key thing to note there is that by default it will run with the root account so you may be asking well what does this mean really in terms of security well it means that in the event of a container breakout and the fact that an attacker is able to you know somehow get out of the container or leverage or find a way an access vector out of the container because they're working within a root process they will have some level of root privileges uh, which again is pretty much one of the worst things uh, that can happen to you on your docker host all right so as a result we need to run containers as an unprivileged user by default that's a really really important aspect here this is not something that is negotiable and remember we're not talking about the container user we're talking about the process under which that container is running and the user that owns that container all right, and this can be uh, this can be done by implementing user namespaces. So we need to reconfigure the Docker daemon to use uh, user namespaces. And uh, you know we will take a look at how to do this practically. But you can specify your own non-privileged user or use the default doc remap user that's generated by Docker, which is what I recommend, so that you keep everything standardized and you don't deviate from uh, and use users that are not verified or users that may actually be uh, be removed from the system one day so i just wanted to make that as clear as possible uh, so with that out of the way we can finally get started with the practical demonstration all right so i'm back on my linux workstation and i've logged into the docker host and we can begin the process of securing the docker daemon um, so we'll get started with one of the most important aspects here and that is uh, controlling who has access to the docker daemon now after you install docker on your system right uh, you're going to need to set up another user that's pretty much a, a security guideline that everyone needs to implement you can't run your your linux server as the root user you need to add another user and the reason why we create uh, other users with different privileges is to you know is based on the concept of least privileges so that every user account on the system only has the permissions uh, and the privileges that they require for their particular role or functionality Now, in the case of Docker, the way Docker implements access control in regards to who has access to the Docker daemon, they do this through the use of a Linux group. All right, so a, a group, again, is uh, just a sorting of users with a specific privilege. So in this case, the privileges that uh, the members of the Docker group will have is the ability to uh, to actually interact with the Docker daemon directly or through the Docker client. So if you've ever used a user without uh, without administrative privileges 
and you have not added that user to the Docker group, they cannot interact with the Docker daemon, uh, you know, directly or through the client. They need administrative privileges. This is by design. Now, given the fact that we've disabled access to the root account and only have access through the user Alexis, what we did during the second video of the series is we added the user Alexis to the Docker group. All right, so the Docker group is, is set up and configured during the Docker installation. Now, we can actually list out the groups on the system by typing in cat etc group right and uh, I'll just type that in correctly and uh, you can see we have the docker group here and one of the members is Alexis that's the only member this is going to be an important aspect in a few seconds so we can view the actual groups that Alexis is part of and in our case you can see he's part of the pseudo group which we added him to because we want him to have administrative privileges but if it was a standard user without pseudo or who was not a part of the pseudo group we can also add them to the good we can add them to the docker group so that they can run docker commands right so alexis can now run docker commands without the pseudo prefix right so i can say for example docker images and i can interact with docker uh, with the Docker daemon uh, through the Docker client or directly, right? Without any issues whatsoever. Now, this is a very, very, very important privilege because it means that any member who is part of, who is a part of the Docker group can interact with, with Docker without anything else, without any other permissions, without any other privileges, because the Docker, uh, the Docker group assigns them these privileges once they're a member. Now, the whole idea of access control is very important when it comes down to security because you're, if you're working in, an, in a development environment, you're going to have a lot of users who are going to need access to Docker, who are going to be using Docker on a daily basis. And as a result, you'll be adding them to the Docker group. Now, what happens during the transition from a development environment into a production environment is that these users are still left as part of the Docker group, you know, and these users could be developers, they could be DevOps engineers, and some of them may still need access in the production environment. However, most of them uh, will not need access. And as a result, what you're doing here is you're having, or is you, you have set up a system where you have multiple access vectors through those user accounts, where if an attacker gets access to either of those accounts, will consequently have access to Docker without any uh, you know, administrative privileges and they can execute Docker commands. Uh, they can take over and modify the Docker daemon. They can take over containers, so on and so forth. So it's very important that you remove users uh, from the Docker group that do not require that particular privilege. So that's the point that I wanted to hit across here. And you should only have users within the group who actually uh, require that privilege and, uh, you know, accounts that are actually secured. In our particular case, the only way to authenticate to the server using the user Alexis is through an SSH key, which we set up. And, uh, you know, that essentially means that the only person who has the key can get access. There's no password authentication whatsoever. And uh, again, we've pretty much secured that aspect and locked it down. Uh, if you want to view the members of the Docker group, you can type in members and we type in Docker and you can see it only says that the user Alexis is part of that group. So I just wanted to, to actually point that out. Now, the next step here is going to be the process of encrypting the communication between the Docker client and the Docker daemon. Now, this is only going to apply to you if you are using a remote, uh, if you are trying to implement, uh, you know, remote authentication between the Docker client and a remote Docker host, right? So in our case, we're not going to do that, but I'll still take you through the process. Now, I have created a bash script that will automate the process of generating the TLS keys, right? So if you head over to this GitHub repository, it'll be in the link in the description and it'll also be part of the documentation found in the ebook. So you can follow along. You want to click on Docker TLS authentication and you want to download the secure Docker daemon uh, bash script here, which I will just get. Uh, so I'll just hit raw here and I'll just w get this here or uh, I'll just open this up within the Docker host here. So I'll say wget and I will uh, get that particular script. Uh, now, once I have it, I need to provide it with executable permissions. So secure, um, secure Docker daemon and I hit enter. So what this script is going to do, if we can just analyze it slightly, is it is going to automatically generate your the required TLS keys. So the required TLS keys are going to be your certificate authority. You're, th you're then going to need your server key uh, and then your, your self-signed certificate for the key, uh, which it will generate automatically. 
and then finally it's going to generate the client keys so the client keys are the keys that you're going to copy to the docker client or to your particular client and uh, all of this will be saved in your home directory under the docker under the dot uh, under the directory docker so this is a dot directory here this is where you typically save configuration files all right in our case it's going to save the keys so we can now execute the secure docker daemon bash script and hit enter so it's going to ask you for your certificate password i'm going to provide my uh, my, my password here and uh, you then want to provide your uh, you need to provide your server name that you'll use to to connect to the docker server so I'll just provide the IP of the Docker host right over here. I'll just copy it from Linode and paste it in there. And I hit enter and it's going to generate all the keys. And the keys, as I said, will be stored within the actual Docker, uh, the Docker directory here. So if I list the contents of that, you can see we have the certificate authority key, the certificate key itself, um, and you then have the key, which is the client key, uh, private key that is, and then you have the server certificate and the server key right so uh, by default i would recommend leaving these keys within this directory however it is recommended that you transfer the certificate key and the actual server cert and server key into the etsy docker uh, directory under a directory called ssl or tls that's what i would recommend uh, but you know in this particular case it's much simpler to keep them in here that's entirely up to you and the 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 guidelines and, and policies that you need to adhere to in your organization or company um, so once we have generated the keys what we need to do now is we need to change the ownership of this docker uh, of this docker directory uh, to root or we need to change the ownership to the root user so to do this we'll say um, sudo chown um, and again you would not need to do this if you you had transferred or if you transfer the actual server keys to the docker configuration directory so chown r and then we say root right and um, root sorry that is just root and then we specify the directory which is uh, home um, home alexis and we just call it docker right and we hit enter and it's going to ask us for a password here which we'll provide and we have changed the ownership right so now in order to make docker or the docker daemon utilize tls uh, verification or tls encryption we need to create our custom uh, system d uh, configuration file that will override the default uh, docker daemon configuration now this can be done uh, by creating a directory we'll just say sudo mkdir and we'll create the directory under etsy systemd and uh, under system and the the actual uh, directory we will create is docker.service um, docker.service.d right so what we're doing here fundamentally is we are going to create a configuration file that will specify how the docker daemon should be run or it will we will use to specify the options and flags and arguments uh, that the docker daemon should run with or should actually use during startup so now that we've done that we need to create the file so it's going to fall under etsy uh, systemd uh, system and uh, under docker service.d and we will call we will call it override uh, dot conf all right so we'll just say override dot conf and i'll hit enter right so within this file we now need to specify uh, that this is a service file right so because we're working under system d uh, however i'm just going to copy in i'm just going to copy the code here and i'll explain what's going on right so uh, i'll just copy that and i'll paste it in here um, by the way that just copied the ip in this particular case what we can do is i can actually just take you through the process here so service we will say that this is a service and then we want to specify the xx start options so these are the flags that will be run uh, during the start of the process or when this this particular service is executed or initiated so we want to say this is user bin docker d that's uh, the actual daemon right and then we want to specify um the actual uh, socket right so we say this is a unix socket here and uh, we have not specified the tcp pro uh, the tcp uh, interface it needs to listen on but we'll just say var uh, run docker dot sock right and then uh, we say tls verify so we're now saying you need to uh, we are enabling the TLS verify option or we're using the flag to set TLS verify to true. 
so we say TLS verify and then we specify the TLS cert, right? So the TLS cert, uh, we need to specify the actual directory and the file. So this is under home, Alexis, um, Docker, and the name of the file is going to be server cert, right? So we already saw that. So server cert uh, .pem, right? And then we need to specify the TLS certificate authority cert, which is TLS CA cert right and uh, that is again going to be under the same directory so home alexis um sorry let me just type that in correctly alexis and then we say uh, docker and the name of the file is going to be uh, ca.pem um so that's the certificate uh, authority certificate and then we specify the tls key right so tls key is going to be again under the same directory so home alexis and of course you might the the the, of, of the home directory will be different in your case and then we specify the server key um server key dot pem right so i'll just type that in server key dot pem and then we specify the actual uh the actual ip or the host ip that we want to listen on or we want the docker daemon to listen on for remote connections and this is just going to be our local host or on all interfaces uh, and the port that we're going to specify is 2376. Now, if you're not using TLS, uh, the actual uh, port is going to be 2375. But because we are using TLS and we've generated our, our certificates, we're just going to say uh, 2376, right? And uh, we can then save this file. Uh, we're just going to hit save. And now we need to restart the, uh, the Docker service. So sudo systemctl uh, restart Docker. And it's going to restart it for us. If we list out uh, the ports that are currently open, uh, we just say N ANTP here. We can see that it's still not loaded the new configuration. So we're just going to restart Docker again. And it tells us that the unit file, source configuration file, drop-ins of the Docker service changed on disk. We need to reload the Docker daemon. So we're going to say sudo uh, systemctl uh, daemon, uh, daemon reload, hit enter. And uh, we then want to restart Docker again. So it's going to say we have an issue here. So we're just going to uh, check the status of the file here. Um, so we're just going to say status. And it looks like we have an issue with uh, one of the arguments that we provided here. Um, so TLS verify TLS cert uh, looks fine there. Right, let, let us just check the errors here. All right, so it looks like we had a bit of an issue with the configuration here. So um, the I think I can see the error here. We did not provide the actual directory, uh, the, the directory here. So I'm just going to, um, what we'll do is uh, we will try and modify this here, which I think uh, the directory is for the TLS certificate authority cert. Uh, so I did not you know type in home correctly so we will again save that correct that and save that and we're just going to restart the daemon again or reload the daemon and uh, we then want to restart docker so we're just going to restart docker again and it looks like it's running fine now we can check the status of the docker service right so status everything looks fine there and uh, I think we, if we type in the netstat command and list the ports that we're currently listening on, we can see that it is listening on 2376, which means the, the Docker daemon has been configured to, to actually uh, authenticate remotely, or you, you can actually authenticate remotely to the Docker daemon using, uh, TLS, uh, you, using the TLS certificates or TLS verification and encryption. And it's running on port 2376 on all interfaces. Uh, and uh, what we can do now is um, we you can now go ahead and start configuring the Docker client. Uh, the files um, that you need to actually copy over to the actual uh, to the actual client are going to be the the actual certificate key uh, and then the private key and uh, the TLS certificate authority key. So again, if I just list out the files that you need to copy over to the client, uh, I'll just you know list them out for you here. So you need to copy over the following file. So you need to copy over the key, 
uh, right over here. You then need to copy over the cert, which I pointed out, and uh, the certificate authority.pem file over to the Docker client. And uh, these three files again need to be saved under the home directory under the Docker container. And then you need to configure a few environment variables. So the first environment variable that you need to configure on your client is is going to be the following so uh, again i'll just take you through the process even beyond it's the uh, even though it's beyond the scope of this series uh the first environment variable that you need to set is going to be docker uh, tls verify and of course this is being done on the client but because i don't have a client here i don't need to do that it's going to be D uh, docker tls verify uh so we want to set that to one so we're enabling tls verification that's the first environment variable that you want to set. Uh, the second environment variable that you want to set is going to be the Docker host IP. So you want to specify the actual host and this is done by providing uh, by saying TCP because we're connecting through TCP and then you provide the IP and the port which in this case is 2376 and that should be configured. Uh, once you're done just hit enter and that'll save that. Uh, you can then uh, export the Docker cert path. So export uh, Docker um cert path and uh, you want to save that i'm just gonna type that in correctly and uh, this is going to be the the directory where we, you're going to save uh, the the actual certificates that i told you to copy over and that is going to be under home uh, your home directory under the docker uh, the docker directory that you created on your client and once that is done you should be able to connect remotely to the docker host um, that being said, that is the process of setting up uh, TLS, you know, verification and encryption and ensuring that communication between uh, the, the Docker client um, and the Docker daemon remotely is secured. So now that we've explored that, we can move on to the next step, which is implementing user namespaces. All right. Now to demonstrate exactly how this works, uh, I am going to run a container here. We're just going to, if I say Docker images, let me just list out the images that we have. So I'm just going to run the Docker, I'm just going to run the Ubuntu image uh, in a container. So I'm, I'm going to say Docker container run, and I want an interactive session here. And I do, I do not want this session, well, I can actually just leave it as is. Uh, I can provide it with a name and we'll just call it test. Uh, and the actual image is Ubuntu and we will say we want a bash session here. So I'm just going to say bash. Uh, well, I need to, pro I actually need to uh, provide the actual um, image name here as opposed to the repository. So 18.04, I'm going to hit enter. And that should create the container for us, right? So if I, we are, we are currently inside the container. So if I say PS, right, I list out the actual, um, the actual process tree, you can see um, if in fact I can actually list I can actually display this with top uh, you can see that bash is running as the user root which is perfectly fine because we're run this is the the container process uh, process tree and the PID is set to one now I'm just going to exit from um, from from the top utility and I'm going to put my my uh, this particular container in the background so there we are. I just uh, put in the background and I, you know, if I can say Docker PSA, um, you can see that it's currently running in the background, right? If I now say, if I open up the top, um, if I open up the top command, well, we can actually just say Docker uh, container and we use the top utility and specify the test, uh, the test uh, name, which was the name given to the container and we hit enter. Uh, we can just hit enter here. You can see, if I can just uh, make sure that this is structured correctly, that this container is running as the root user. So you can see you, uh, the user ID is set to root, but under a different process ID. So this is the concept of namespaces, right? So namespaces allow isolation of containers and you know it, it provides them with their own process tree, process ID. Uh, but the problem is that this container is running as the user root, which means that if, if there is a container breakout, then this uh, then that particular attacker will be will get root privileges, you know. So I just wanted to point that out, and that's the issue that we're trying to remedy here. So uh, I will just remove this particular container now. So Docker remove, um, and we'll just specify the container name, which is test. 
and it's going to remove it so we can just confirm that it's been removed here there we are so it's removed uh, what we need to do is we need to use or we need to remap um, the actual namespace uh, to the default map or, or to the default option now when we talk about mapping namespaces and subordinate users if i list out the actual directory uh, for the subordinate users on the system you can see you type in a, a sub uid uh, that is sub uid let me just type that in you can see the only user we have on the system and that makes sense is going to be the user lexis so we can specify that all containers should run with the privileges of the user Alexis. However, the user Alexis has administrative privileges because he's part of the sudo group. So I'm going to use the, the default user that is created by Docker and that is the doc remap user. Now this can be done by again using the or providing the user namespace remap option and specifying the default user and again we can do this this is why i created the custom override configuration file uh, this can be done by modifying the etsy uh, system d file uh, that we created which is uh, under um, which is under system and docker service.d and override uh, dot conf right so all we need to do is remember these are the arguments that the docker daemon is going to run uh, when it is started up so we can go all the way to the end here and we can specify the flag the uh, the user namespace remap flag uh, so we will just type in right over here i'll just space that out so we can say uh, user namespace user r um, user ns and then we say remap that's going to be equal to the default docker user so that is the default um doc remap user and you'll see that that particular user will be created um, so now that we have provided that uh, we, can, we now need to reload the docker daemon so we will reload the docker daemon really simply here by uh, if i can just find the command there we are docker or daemon reload that's going to reload the the daemon and then we need to restart docker or the docker service and hopefully there aren't any configuration issues so we'll just restart the docker daemon and it looks like it's running without any issues if we now list out the actual um, sub user ids um, or the subordinate user ids you can see that the docker or the doc remap user has been created and now every container is going to have or is going to run under the process uh the the process id of doc remap which is unprivileged by default which means even in the event of a container breakout uh, that particular attacker will not have any administrative or root privileges right so we can actually demonstrate this by creating the actual or running the container one more time so again within the container it's still going to be run as the as the as the user root and i've already talked about this uh, uh or i'm going to talk about it during the, the the actual video where we cover securing docker containers how to change the default user within the docker container and how to create users and so on and so forth uh, but if i run it uh, you can see that it's going to grab the ubuntu image locally that's because we have changed namespaces before we were running in the default namespace now we've changed namespaces to that of the uh of the doc remap right so uh, it had to grab a new image because the permissions have changed so again if i say top again you can see that it's still running under the user root within the container so this is the uh, the isolated uh, container and again this is facilitated through namespaces uh, but now if we actually um, if we actually put this in the background and uh, we again type in docker container and we specify the utility top and the name is just test right which we provided you can now see that it runs under the user id 165536 which is the user id for the doc remap user uh, right over here so that actually confirms it and as i said in the event of a container breakout uh, this particular that particular attacker will not have any additional privileges that they can use to take further control over uh, over the particular host all right so that is uh, the namespace uh, or actually you know implementing name user namespaces uh, for the docker daemon 
and of course consequently for the docker containers uh, now let us talk about inter-container communication right uh, so inter-container communication is something that you may require based on your circumstances but it is required uh, to it is actually recommended to disable it if you do not need your containers to communicate with each other as i said however it's entirely up to you and your configuration whatever you choose to use but again uh, disabling inter-container communication is fairly simple all we need to do is modify the configuration file the override file that we created so uh, we'll just open up that file again and uh, we will head over to the end right and uh, right over here actually i'll just do it uh, from here and I'll, i will simply say we will provide the flag and by the way these are all docker daemon commands that i'm using the only thing we're doing is we're specifying that when the docker daemon runs it should run with these particular options or with this particular configuration so to disable intercontainer communication all we need to do is type in uh, icc and that is equal to false right so we're disabling it and again if you want to enable it you can get rid of this flag or just you can change the value the boolean value to true all right so that is done i can now save the file and uh, we now need to reload uh, the daemon uh, so i'm just going to find that particular command there we are daemon reload and we now need to restart the docker service all right so it restarted without any issues and we now should have inter container communication disabled so the only way to verify what we've implemented is to run the docker bench security utility right and to get a fresh a fresh benchmark so i'm going to open up the directory docker bench security and uh, we are going to run it um, so docker bench security and hit enter and let's see if our score has improved all right so you can see that uh, it performs uh, 84 checks and our score has improved drastically uh, we have we now have a score of 30 which is great so again uh, to recap what we've been able to do so far is to uh, is to actually secure the host configuration so the with the one exception of the separate partition for containers which is again entirely up to you uh, but under the docker daemon configuration you can see that ensure the network traffic is restricted that is the uh inter container communication which we actually disabled so um is restricted between containers on the default bridge so that is disabled uh we then also uh, the tls authentication is configured um we also enabled user namespace support which we got a pass for um so the only other options here um are, are to do with the authorization for the docker client commands which we will take a look at when we get started with access control uh, as for centralized and remote logging that's again going to be dependent on your organizational requirements and then ensure containers are restricted from acquiring new privileges again that can be uh, that can be configured uh, again during the container security video we'll take a look at how to configure that during the container security video um, and ensure live restore is enabled that's not really required but as far as all the other options for the docker daemon configuration files are concerned we pretty much get a pass for all the uh, the actual checks that are important um, and uh, again for the container images and build file uh, we, we, we're still to actually take a look at that so that's pretty much all that i wanted to cover in this video and i'll be seeing you in the next video a huge thank you to all of our patreons uh, your support is greatly appreciated and this is a formal thank you so thank you shamir douglas ryan carr sandor michael busby sid saab doozy dafim bari dustin umpress and michael hubbard your support is greatly appreciated and you keep us making even more high quality content for you guys so thank you